refer oh. to the cloud. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yes. Well, dos, Dina, dos John Dines, I want to welcome you to this session that you are doing with us on uh, adaptive leadership uh, with Awareness IQ. It's my great pleasure. Uh, I've just been realizing my knowing of you is since 2003, and maybe this is one of the times that I would like to reference a very formal introduction of you. Uh, you are Dos Jandinas MBA MCC, and you are the first mm -hmm. ICF accredited M master certified coach in Turkey and South East Europe which is quite something. Yeah. You are a head coach <laughs> and founder of Mara Fidelis Coaching and Consulting, which is the premier coaching mm -hmm. company in the region, uh, serving leaders from all walks of life. You have extensive experience coaching C-level, high-driving executives and leaders, specializing in coaching the top leader and his or her executive team and, their high, and also high-impact interventions. You've coached managing directors, CEO, general managers, SV, senior VPs, and AGMs of the top 500 Turkish uh, companies and Turkish subsidiaries of Fortune 500 global companies. And joyfully, you co-founded the Gestalt Center of Coaching, that's where I join you as partner, with flagship offering is the ICF ACTP Gestalt Coaching Program, where you serve as co-chair and faculty. You're also the author of the best-selling uh, book on coaching, which is Cesar Sorlu, which means Courageous Questions, which is now in his 12th printing. I uh, always get questions about your book yeah. and how the impact it's made all over Turkey. I wish it were in English. Uh, you are mm. also a Qigong instructor mm -hmm. and a meditation leader. And I think the thing that's so clear to me, Dost, in all the years of knowing you as we have programs on group leadership and mastery and now your program on adaptive um, leadership is the relationship I know that you have between being and doing, where your doing serves your being. And as we talk about mm -hmm. this session today, I welcome your voice and I also welcome our dear friends who are on this call and our colleagues who are wonderful and those who will be listening as well. Thank you. And Dos, as you say in Turkish, Hoş geldin, welcome. And I turn to you. Okay, thank you very much, Dorothy. I mean, this, this is, the, I mean, the stuff you read is what's in my bio and it's, it's always interesting to hear it when it's read out loud. So, you know, <laughs> it creates some kind of a shame. You know? <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> not shame, like, you know, like, a, like an embarrassment. Shame is not the right word. No, English is my second language. So, anyway. So, you know, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, may I just do one, yeah. little, may I do one little segue, those from a culture? Sure, from, please do so. We Canadian Americans yeah. like to make very loud when we see something wonderful. Yeah. And the Turkish way is to be yeah. more modest and not showing off. Yeah. So, Say very yeah. modestly, I appreciate the things that I'm not going to make loud anymore, but thank you and welcome. <laughs> no, no, you, you were perfect though. I just, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's about awareness and this is part of, this is the, the part that comes around. Mm, that's how it sounds when it is read, you know. Yeah. And, um, and actually this definitely leads us to our uh, session, which I want to talk about you know, as you said, and uh, it's also nice to hear some of the voice, the phrases that I like John, John Ledwood and everyone else. Um, the, the topic that I'm going to talk about today or the, 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 the material that I'm going to share uh, comes out of my own uh, practice uh, as, a, as a leadership coach. And I've been doing this uh, maybe for now 16, 17 years, 16 years, hard to believe, but true. It's even scary you know, <laughs> times. So anyway, uh, I'm, what I'm going to do, what I actually am trying to do right now is I'm also trying to learn how to do the uh, mouse thing here. Just sorry about that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so what I'm, just hold on, yeah, okay. Now I'm, I'm learning this, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, okay, good, just hold on. Yes, much better. So, what I want to start with this is, as Dorit said, uh, 
as I'm teaching in the Gestalt coaching program. And I'm also, you know, doing some other work, as Dorita mentioned, with uh, people who are uh, graduates of our program and our other many other programs in Turkey. And the topic is usually about, you know, uh, how to coach leaders in the organizations. You know, how can we be, provide better uh, coaching or uh, more effective coaching when we are actually working with real leaders and leadership. And in this five-day program that I run, and everybody who attends this program are, are uh, trained coaches. Most of them are certified by ICF and maybe other, other uh, bodies who cert which certify. And then, I mean, I see this pattern all the time. You know, it's, it's just a, such a familiar pattern. And, and the funny thing was, uh, Dorothy and I did uh, this, uh, like an introductory workshop in Toronto, like a few years ago. And just the week before that, I was doing my own workshop with this advanced workshop in leadership coaching. And in this workshop, as we always do, we had practicals. You know, we had people come in, in little groups. They brought in their own kind of issues, organizational issues, all of them. And um, either they themselves as leaders or uh, they were talking about someone they were coaching to. And, they, you know, and each of them was coaching someone and we as faculty were just observing them and giving feedback as we do in, in practicums. And this, the pattern that I observed, which repeated like so many times was, you know, the client will tell a story. It was usually a complex and, uh, and not an easy organizational problem. And these organization problems sometimes included like family dynamics, you know, and some of these people were working in family, family situations, whatever, you know, or big organizations. And there was a lot of complexity in the room and it was not clear what to do. And, and what happened was when, and the coaches sometimes worked themselves into a corner by, you know, just asking all these questions and, you know, working with some kind of um, a theory in their mind and they just cornered themselves in or get, get themselves stuck. And whenever get, they got themselves stuck, one thing they like did was like repeatedly did was, you know, they will just go to, uh, to their favorite coaching tool or coaching structure or algorithm they learned at their school. And one favorite thing that repeatedly came out was, you know, they would ask their clients, you know, they're stuck. You can see that they're in their, in their faces and they will say, so, you know, what, from one to 10, you know, what is the number you want to reach, you know, someone will say eight, and then they will say, so where are you now? Three, you know, how can you get from three to, three to nine? And this repeated like every time someone was stuck. And I was just saying, if someone's, you know, make use of this, um, sometimes useful when used in the correct time, tool and technique out of context, you know, I'm just going to throw myself out of the window. So anyway, this workshop finished, I came back to, I came to Toronto to do the workshop with, Dor with Dorothy and there were other people in the room in Toronto, not in Istanbul. And we were doing practicum, same structure. You know, someone got stuck, you know, same structure. So one out of 10, you know, one to 10, where do you want to be? Nine, where are you? Three, right? how can you get from three to nine? So, you know, I, so I was just curious, what's going on? What's really going on? You know, how can we be of service to our clients? You know, what is the context of leadership? You know, what is needed from, our, from the people we are coaching, who are leaders, I mean, the people I'm coaching are usually leaders, they are top leaders in their organization, you know, a certain percentage of my clients have been really the CEOs or the you know, managing directors or presidents of their companies or, you know, the next level. And these guys are really dealing with tough questions. So the questions that I would like to respond to today and give you a kind of a, my take on the subject is, you know, what is the job of leadership? How do leadership create value? What is the real thing going on? You know, what is required of our leaders to provide that, of our leaders, required of our leaders to provide that value? That, you know, how can do their job the best way? And what is our role as leadership coaches? So these will be the three topics that I want to, uh, I will try to respond, and I think I need to get that person in, right? So let me, I don't know how to do that while I'm also, yeah, just hold on. Uh, yes, okay. So I'm, I have 
to get this admins this person. Let me just say to everybody, Dose, that you are trying to get someone into the phone who's on an, into the session who's on an iPhone, correct? Yes, I think so. I think you did. Okay, it. I think I, I, yeah, I, I think I did. So these are the three questions that I would like to respond and work around. And I'm, you know, as I've been, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a synthesizer. I've worked with many uh, people, which I call my elders, you know, um, and I learned a lot from them. And uh, I kind of synthesized all that I learned into a working model. You know, that kind of worked for me over these 60 years and, and with my clients. So what I want to share is this, this model that I'm, I am interested in. And one thing that I observe in coaching uh, generally, and, and especially the people who, are, who come to coaching from other areas than, than the organization consulting. This is not something that I observe from organization, people who are actually are both organizational consultants and coaches, but who, the people who come to coaching mostly from the other, other areas is, is something that I observe, and especially sometimes in our Gestalt coaches too, is we like to coach people from the inside out, you know, which, which means to say, we want to learn what this person wants, we want to actually attend to the question of, you know, what do you want to achieve? What is your dream? What is your, you know, what are your strengths, in, especially in the executive project? So what are the some, some competencies you want to develop, you know, and what are some, um, you know, um, you know, all these competencies, you know, let's look at uh, where you are good at, where you're not good at, you know, let's, let's give it, have a sense. So when you actually get inside of that, you know, when you actually can, if you, we can get inside you, so we can have, help you make, create better impact on the outside, you know, your team, your people, your behavior, Maybe, and that's going to create a bit better impact on the, you know, organization, you will reach your goal. So this, this is what I call inside out coaching, which is very useful. I'm a total fan of it. But what I observe that's been happening is, it has been for me and for other people useful to an extent. And this is what I what mean by useful to an extent. So before I wanna, go there, I just want to, you know, to, to, to get there, I want to talk about something that I, uh, I'm very, some work that I've been very fan of. It's by a German psychologist, Dietrich Dörner, and he has a wonderful book called The Logic of Failure, and he looks at this question of how does leadership fail, you know, and he's, I think he's, he's a professor of psychology at the University of, uh, I don't know, Hamburg or somewhere in Germany. And maybe he's, he was, I'm pretty, the book is quite old. I don't know if he's still alive or he's still teaching. But he looks at the question of, you know, how people make mistakes, you know, very clever, uh, very smart people, how they make, you know, uh, very simple mistakes when they're actually dealing with complex problems. So what he will do is he will just take two people, he usually works with two people, like into an experiment at his laboratory, like, to a simulation, and the simulation is usually about either, you know, uh, about a company, like about an economical system, like a city, and one favorite of his, of his, he looks at the simulation of the life, you know, improving life standards of this sub-Saharan made up, actually, a tribe called Moros, you know. So he, you know, you will go into his laboratory, if you are participating in this experiment, and he would say, now, this is this is the situation. You know, you know, your job is to, in this computer simulation to increase the life standard of these morals. And the, the situation is he gives you the data, they have very little land for agriculture, very low number of commercial animals, and many diseases because they are they, they don't have enough animals, but the, the ones they have, you know, the, the, the mosquitoes are eating away. You know, there are many diseases as they are living in swamp areas, they have very little usable water in water. You know, they have high infant mortality, short expected, like all that stuff, you know, you could guess, you get the picture. So they say, you know, some funding is available and you have authoritative power, you have dictatorial power, you know, it's an, an exercise in uh, developmental economics. You know, what's going to do is you're just going to look at the numbers, we'll give you numbers, you will 
discuss with your partner and make some decisions. We will feed into the machine your policy decisions and we will give you the numbers next year, you know. And he just details it very well, but, you know, just to, if you just like summarize all the data, there are like many uh, measures of this life standard, but if you summarize all the data, what happens is these guys discuss and, you know, and the, the, the policy decisions are not that difficult. You, know, you either, you know, maybe dig deep water holes, you know, you just do vaccination, you, you, you know, you have but not limited. So you do some stuff. So what happens is after those interventions, usually the life standard of the morals starts to go, you know, and they go up and the people are asking each other questions and they are discussing together. They are looking at the data, they are taking new. And these are like the 20 years you can see in the, in the uh, bottom. It's like a 20 year exercise, you know. You know the, you, and what happens, it, it starts to increase and after a while the increase really gets quite high. You know, it's, it's, the life standard is going up, you know, the infant mortality is down, lifespan increases at like 78, 9, 10 years. You know, there are now, you know, they just uh, kill the swamps and now they have more irritable, agriculture land and what happens is at around year 10 or 11 sometimes 50 you know things start to go out of hand a little bit you know what happens is they now have too much animals too many animals because they have they don't have the mosquitoes anymore they have more animals but the economical environment cannot take more animals you know they cannot sell more animals. there is not a market or you know the uh, the increased rate of population gets out of control or, you know, they, because they are digging wells in the sub-Sahara area, you know, these, uh, the, uh, the yield rate of these wells starts to go down. And these two guys, given their success before, you know, are, are already are not asking as many questions as they were asking and are not making many thought experiments as they were doing in the beginning and they are making much more decisions that they were doing. And what happens is, is the result of this experiment usually ends up in a disaster. You know, the, uh, because they could not take preventive actions and they are not taking in all these new conditions, uh, Dr. Dörner says 90% of, 90 of these smart people trying to intervene in the system as they have not taken into all this complexity of the system, all these balances, checks and balances in this, you know, natural system, they actually kill the natural system and end up at a place worse than they have started. So question is, how can this happen? You know, these two, these, these, uh, and these, all these people are like, you know, they're either scientists, they are like managers, they are people with high or above average IQ. How can this happen? And the question is, Maybe it's awareness. You know, maybe we're not seeing what's going on. And I just really love this. You know, maybe they are not seeing their face and the impact they are doing. And uh, maybe something else is needed. You know, what's the kind of leadership uh, that's being done? So what are typical areas? You know, if you look at the situations and if I look at my clients, all the errors they have made and I have actually coached them to do, usually they end up in, in several um, um, categories. One is definitely, you know, we are and my clients are usually are thinking in a linear way in a complex environment. You know, when we think about awareness, we think awareness is about myself, my emotions, that's what I call inside out. You know, it's all about me, my emotions, my thoughts, my, you know, relationship with the uh, outside or stuff. Maybe I should really be, or my clients and our leadership clients, be more aware of the, the situations or the environments they are, they are in, you know. And as much as I like to see the otherwise, I would say most of us are not, and our brains and the way we think, as Robert Keegan would say, is not, has not been evolved enough yet to actually, uh, to understand the, complex environments we are in. And we actually form our thinking and our interventions in a more linear, you know, effect and result, effect and result way, you know. And in these effect and results are not like, you know, really um, uh, too, are not 
complex in their own sense. You know, it's usually if you dig too many wells in sub-Sahara, you know, you're just going to end up water and it's not going to replenish because you're in Sahara, you know. And, but it's not just that, there are too many of that. But are also, we overestimate the power of authority for change, you know, because we have authoritarian power and we think that just using that authority is going to create the type of change we want. And we, I'm going to, in a minute, also talk about the type of change that is needed or that is wanted. But, you know, you cannot, um, which, which is not, you know, this power of authority is for change. Usually is a, is a huge, huge overestimation in my, uh, in my observation. And, um, and the inside out coaching, which as I call it, is usually, or the, most of the executive coaching that I see uh, that's been done is usually not about increasing the capacity for leadership or exercising leadership, as I will define it, is about uh, most of the leadership coaching that I see has been done is how can I get people to give more authority? Now, most of the, you know, how I can get more, uh, or how can I get better to assume or make people give me more authority, make, give me, make people give me more power, which is important, needed, but not enough. Because the type of change we are talking about is, oops, I'm going to just put that over this good intentions, is not a technical change, but an adaptive challenge. Uh, technical challenge, what I mean by it is, you know, God forbid, if someone has a heart condition, what would that person do? They will go to a doctor. You know, a heart condition with all its complexity, with all this difficulty is a known problem that can be solved with the, tech, with the, uh, with the known technology. And, you know, technical problems are solved with technical expertise, which also gives person authority. And if, the, if this person goes to this heart surgeon, you know, cardiologist, whatever, and, and we always usually go to the most authoritative, which means the best uh, and most famous and most uh, decorated professional expert we can get or we could afford. You know, we go to that person. And if that person, let's say that person made the perfect um, operation and, um, you know, my problem is cured. And, um, you know, the card is perfect, the person's heart is perfect now. The problem is with all the expertise and the authority of this person, he won't be able to make this person make the changes he needs to make or she needs to make in his or her lifestyle that will make this person live his life or her life in a healthy way in his remaining time. You know, it's, it's, this is called an adaptive change. This person has to be involved. This person has to uh, make uh, be part of the change and because of this most of the the interventions or most of the leadership interventions that I see are being made are by our politicians by our CEOs by our you know business leaders we are too much focused on the technical side and a little bit less on the adaptive side because adaptive challenges adaptive changes needs people to be involved you know this is the, the yes Dorothy for a moment. Yes, Dorothy. So great yeah. to listen to you on. I know how long you've been working. Can you give us a small little example of this? Because when you talk about it now, this is the big, there's so much authority in the world now and issues of authoritarian leadership. Can you give us a small yeah. example? Because it's so powerful what you're saying. And actually this is the huge. So, so, give, so, let, so let me give you this example, you know, and I'm going to give you an, a, a striking example from my country. You know, Turkey has a long history of uh, coups by the military, you know, and the last successful one was uh, many years ago, maybe 40 years ago, uh, 38 years ago, on September 12th, 1980, and it was a successful coup. And the reason for it to be successful was because of the situation Turkey was in, you know, and if you look at about authority, if you think about authority, authority is actually uh, is a social contract. You know, authority is, you know, you're giving someone power in exchange of a service. 
you know, when uh, the gorillas, when they wake up, what they do is they first look towards the silverback gorilla. You know, he's called silverback because they have his, you know, he has age and he has, you know, his back is, is silver, you know, he's, he has age. And this person, this uh, elder gorilla, who the whole tribe of the gorilla has given authority to, because he, he provides some service because he provides some direction. He knows where the food is. This is why he's given authority. And the second service he provides is whenever some danger happens, he's been there, you know, he knows what to do. So when there's a, a danger happening, you know, all the, uh, the gorillas look up to him and he just collects everyone. He provides protection, you know. And the third thing is when the two gorillas actually start fighting, he comes in and he provides order. He just breaks up the fight. So authority is a social contract. It is power in exchange of three things, direction, uh, protection, and uh, an order. In 1980, before 1980, Turkey was in, in brink of a civil war, and Turkey was not able to elect a president for one and a half years. You know, they were beaver because it was supposed to be elected by the parliament, and it was so divided, there was no, there was no election of a, uh, the, the election wasn't final. We couldn't elect a president for this country. And what also happened is, uh, and there was, you know, people were killing each other on the street. There was no protection, there was no order. So when the military came in and seized power on the night of or the morning of uh, September 12th, everybody in this country cheered up, including my father, who is a leftist, who, uh, who is, you know, who's counter-authority, he, he was happy. Because, you know, hey, now some, there is order, now we will know direction and all that stuff. And it, ended, it didn't end up well, but you know, these guys who, the guy who made the coup was able to get 92% public vote, popular vote to be elected as the president. Then we come like two years ago uh, in September 15, and when there was this coup again, because Turkey didn't have that conditions, there was no sense of indirection. There was a certain sense of order and there was a certain sense of uh, protection, even if you don't like it. You know, the coup wasn't successful. And uh, what happened is the coup itself created the, uh, the scare, you know, the, the, it scared so much the people. We are seeing this problem happening in Turkey again. People gave the current government, you know, Erdogan government, now so much power, so much authority, because they were really afraid of non-direction, non-protection, and non-order. Now he has so much power, and probably is going to have more power in the coming elections. The problem is, with all this authority, can he solve Turkey's problems? Or with all the authority in the world, can you know any leader, Trump, Macron, whoever, any uh, any uh, leader of any company can solve the problems which are adaptive, which means it will need people to face hard problems and which, will, which actually also um, uh, dangers their own sense of being, which I'm going to run into. And they will, you know, can, can this type of leadership, can, can it cure the problems with just authority? You know, people has to be involved. And in this sense, most if not all leadership failures are areas of diagnosis. This is, you know, comes from Ron Tigers, one of my teachers, and he's actually the originator of the term adaptive leadership. And he says, if he, the leader does not, he says, exercising leadership is mobilizing people to make progress on top problems that matter. You know, for example, the Kurdish problem, you cannot solve it by authority. It needs to be the two sides of the people, uh, the two sides of the problem has to be involved. They have to come together. All has to take some losses to actually find a common ground to solve the problem. You know, this is what we call by adaptive problem. And adaptive problems are not solved by authority. You know, you cannot find the authoritarian military solutions. You know, for example, the, you know, the uh, North I Irish problem wasn't solved with military. It was solved by two parties engaging together and each part taking a loss so they could make some kind of progress. 
And if you're if you're exercising this kind of leadership, and if you're and we're coaching to this kind of leadership, and it's also the happens in the organizations all the time. I'm coaching a, someone right now. He is trying to create so big a change in a company, who has been led by a very egotistical person, very, very very egocentric way. The company was run by an egocentric way, and the company there was this person who was heading the company for like 20 years. This was a company. Um, how can I say it? This was a Turkish subsidiary of an international company. The guy seemed successful who was heading the company and the numbers were good so nobody cared to question him but when they were actually were able to audit the company after like 20 years the guy was thrown away because there was so many different stuff and this my client was brought in and then she was brought into the situation uh, and the the mandate given to her was to turn this company who was run in a very egocentric person-centric way, you know, everybody dependent on the whatever came out of the two lips of this guy, you know, whatever he said was like God's decree. And her job is was to transform this company into a company that actually people can think, people can question, people can debate, people can fight, and people can actually agree together. Uh, so, you know, how easy is that? Can authority do that? How can this person, my client, can engage the whole company in this change process, which is a cultural change, so that you know the change is possible? So this is kind of the change we're talking about, and we're talking. I'm talking about coaching to the leaders who are actually trying to exercise leadership in this way. And and if you're if you're coaching this way, as I said before, inside out works to a degree. You know, inside out, you know, hey, what do you want? What are your competencies? You know, these guys first have to not to fall in the trap of the, uh, the clients of Dr. Derner. They have to learn how to look outside in. They have to make a better assessment of the context they are finding themselves in, better assessment of what's going on outside, and better assessment of all the impacts, all the constituencies they have, you know, all the... Uh, problems they are going to create by actually engaging people in this type of adaptive change. So one very important uh, thing to look at is to understand for these guys when looking outside in is systems are complex and we fall into predictable areas in, in these systems. And when I say this, I just really like this VUCA language, you know, these systems bring with themselves all this volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And just to, uh, just because we are humans and I just don't want to go into this, all this very well-known uh, structure of how our neuroscience works, we just fall into all these traps and we work, put ourselves in amygdala hijack, which means we, put, we find ourselves in the fight, flight, and freeze mode. And we and my clients can actually find ourselves in. Um, I just want to move forward. Uh, problems with, you know, when the situations they find ourselves and just end up being too much, too fast, too early, which is an actually a description of the trauma. And you know, it's and some of my clients actually are really showing some you know post-traumatic syndrome symptoms. And and what happens is in these complex situations, and if you're leading an adaptive change, the most important thing for any leader that I am working with is to be able to, you know, be focused on their agenda. And when you are actually triggered by the, your amygdala and all the stuff that's going on in your head and all the, your emotions and the emotions on the outside, and if you're not really making a good assessment of the outside in situation that you're finding yourself in, what's going to happen is, you are going to lose your attention and you are going to not be in charge of your attention. And, you know, as the energy goes and all the movement goes where the attention is, you are just going to, as a leader, are not going to be in charge of your attention and the change initiative, the adaptive change you are in charge of is going to be lost. Um, 
So I'm just moving forward a little bit to, you know, I'm going to uh, just want to move a little bit forward. I know I'm just, just passed too fast on these two subjects because I just want to come back afterwards. After I talk, you know, what I really coach people on, you know, given this picture, what do you mean by, you know, leadership coaching? And when I look at all the people that I have coached in, and if I can categorize, you know, what I've been coaching in, you know, what, how these people that I coached in, you know, worked themselves up in corners, you know, how could they, how actually they ended up doing all the leadership mistakes, or I ended up actually getting stuck in their leadership, you know, like five general areas come from, you know, and I, when I think about it, I don't find, you know, that I don't find many examples that actually fall outside of these, these five areas that I coach in. And when I look at it, you know, um, most of my clients, the way they were not be able to exercise this kind of leadership and ended up doing something else, you know, the first way they actually become hindrances to themselves were they were moving forward with unrealistic expectations, desires, and wants. And what I mean by that is, uh, is, is illustrated by this, this situation that I see like many times over. Uh, this client of mine has been just uh, promoted the position of a CEO or, or the president. And, and he just moves into his, uh, you know, quarters or whatever he just thinks, he looks at situations, he creates this wonderful new vision, he creates new strategy, and, and he just announces new strategy and the new direction. And everybody goes, hey, you know, wonderful. Let's go forward with that. And usually what happens is, you know, after the announcement, people just do what they have done all the time. You know, it's, it's in Turkey, it's very famous saying by Atatürk, our leader, you know, when he was fighting all these invaders of the country after uh, you know winning some war he is is famously announced you know troops your first uh, target is Mediterranean you know because Turkey is in Mediterranean and these guys come and say you know troops your first target is Mediterranean and nobody goes to Mediterranean you know they usually do what they were doing and he just looks at the situation our, uh, our leader or my client CEO he says troops you didn't understand you know, to Mediterranean, I said. Everybody says, okay, okay, we understand you. You know, you're perfect. Let's go to Mediterranean. And still nobody goes to Mediterranean. And what happens is, after like third times, third time, these people enter into the system, start to micromanage, control the whole system, and try to push the whole system to Mediterranean. So one very familiar unrealistic expectation, which goes to people assuming too much authority and not enough adapt doing too much of time, not enough leadership is because we want to be in control of all the processes and everything that's going on. And, uh, and which, is un, which is unrealistic. And why doing that we give up the only thing that we actually, actually have to actually move the ship forward, which I would call power, you know, to influence people, to make people trust you, to make people move in the direction that you want them to move. The same, I mean, the second thing that I observe a lot is uh, that is very unrealistic is you know before i go there you know i th i would say most of my clients that i'm coaching on them with them is a, 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 some version of how they are their relationship with control you know how they are actually doing using control the, and their relationship with power which we will need in of course in leadership which is about how to exercise the power to create some adaptive change and the second uh, thing that I observe a lot is um, is about the um, is actually can be is is it also as control is very basic to human existence. This is also the second things are very basic to human existence as well. And I'm just going to try to take this person in again. Just hold on, how I'm because I cannot do it. So the second part is that I observe a lot is 
is actually they straighten in the Bible, you know, in the story of the Genesis. You know, Adam and Eve are just hanging around in the Garden of Eden, and they are free to do everything they want. The only thing they cannot do is, of course, you know, eat the the uh, the, the fruit of the forbidden tea, uh, tree, and they. If, as much as that tree is called the apple tree, or it's it's been kind of related, they find people are tell that it's related to sex. I find it is not related. I think it's not related to sex at all. But, you know, so as some of you may know, the tree is called the tree of knowledge. It's not the no, the tree of knowledge means in this context the knowledge of right and wrong. So by eating that that fruit. What they have gained is the ability to, to decide. And if you gain ability to decide, you lose one luxury that all of my clients are, are just wanting and, and dying to get for. And I call it the luxury of innocence. So one area that I coach, which one another uh, unrealistic uh, expectation is, you know, these people that I'm coaching, they want to be innocent. They want to be liked, they want to be happy, uh, they want to be liked by all the people, which is impossible, of course. So, you know, um, uh, I would say this is one of the, you know, if you are in, char in a position of power, and if you are a position of authority and leadership, and if you are going to make, make a decision, make a decision, uh, what's, I'm just getting some chats notes. Okay, so sorry about that. Uh, if you are in position of authority, and then you make decisions, you know, most of your decisions this is either going to make one third of the people will be happy, other third will be unhappy, and the other third won't care. You know, and which brings us again to the uh, act of leadership. And as leaders, as leaders, when our clients are taking leadership they won't have the luxury of innocence. And, and uh, just to be desired, you know, which is a very normal existential desire. And I find myself coaching to that desire to how to let go and replace with responsibility, how to replace control with power most of the time. And uh, there are many others that I can just show you a little bit, which I don't go into detail, uh, but when we don't, when I see my, you know, other thing that I see a lot is when the unrealistic expectations are not satisfied, uh, what happens is people get disappointed. And when they get disappointed, which is actually the second um, um, uh, hindrance that I see, they get angry. They, get, they, they see other people who actually are, I'm just going to articulate this who are actually, uh, they see as an hind or a barrier to their satisfaction, uh, their barrier to their control, their, their, as a barrier to their feeling good about themselves. They will get polarized and they will be Ill, Ill will produce. So I have clients who actually call their uh, employees as midgets, you know, because they see they, them as the reason for uh, not being able to control, and the, the attitude actually looks like, you know, being at the being angry at the weather because it's raining. You know, uh, why is there not control? Because you know the results actually are are dependent on many conditions. It's dependent on the context. It's another. It's, it's a situation that cannot be stopped. Authority. It's an adaptive change, and it involves many factors than myself. So. It's unrealistic, and because I, that unrealistic thing does not happen by my authority, I get angry, I get disappointed, I get, I start accuse other people, I get, I produce ill will. So that's kind of the second uh, fallback um, that I observe many of the people that I coach, uh, and I try to coach them out of making better assessment of what's really going on. The third part, you know, if I cannot accuse someone on outside, I accuse myself and, you know, I couldn't control it before because I wasn't, you know, I didn't get myself because I couldn't control before and I controlled it more. It leads to more micromanagement, it's more stress. And 
what ends up is something and I'm working like crazy. I'm working maybe 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day, but I'm, as control is not possible, and as it's not possible to make everybody like me, and the adaptive change is needed, and adaptive change by definition means disturbing people at the rate they can tolerate, you know, because people are what in the adaptive change, people want you to be the authority, want you to be the expert, and they want you to provide the solutions they definitely need. They don't want you to make, they don't want you to disturb and, you know, face the hard choices you want to make, like as in any, any big change that I've been talking about. They, but the art of leadership is actually making you face the, these kind of big changes. And, and uh, because that I wanna, don't want to do that, uh, because that I want to, uh, because when I go there, when I actually create the adaptive process, there will be no control, people will be disturbed, and they won't be happy with me. I will not be innocent anymore. And, uh, and I will, I mean, as I said, I'm going to disturb people. Uh, I try to control the situation a little bit more because I want to go there, which is, this is why I call it a disturbance or as a hindrance to leadership. And I cannot get what I want. I get angry with people. You know, I'm not getting what I want. Just I'm not getting what I want because I'm not, I'm not exercising leadership because of my unrealistic expectations of control, you know, luxury of innocence and all that stuff. And I'm getting disappointed. And I'm also accusing myself because I'm not, I couldn't get my, the results that I want. I'm not getting the results that I want because not, I'm not exercising leadership. I'm using my authority. I'm losing control. And then I get going to something I call leadership laziness. You know, I'm working like hell. I'm micromanaging. I'm maybe because I'm doing what I know best. Maybe I'm getting results, but I'm actually lazy. I'm not kind of exercising leadership the way I described. I'm not mobilizing people to face the most important problems and make progress on them. And what ends up happening is when I give these kinds of trainings and I'm talking about leadership uh, and people end up asking me questions. And one of the very, very frequent questions that I got asked, maybe some of you as well is, so those, you know, yes. And they ask, so do you think leaders, leaders are born or made? You know, and is that a question? You know, it usually is, a, there's a statement behind that. The statement is, is, is based on this doubt and loss of faith. You know, is leadership possible at all? This is kind of the fifth hindrance. You know, we lose our faith in leadership. We lose our faith in our own leadership. Can I learn this? This is so difficult because control is not possible. Because when I exercise leadership, you know, people won't like it. You know, and some people will be disturbed, and or you know, uh, and they will be asking for my for myself from authority. This is why it's so important uh, to understand what's going on. And if I actually did coach from the inside out, out will I get to do this, this real understanding of what kind of leadership is needed? This is why this is, it is so important to start from the outside in because others, other ways we are going to be uh, lost in, the, um, in, the, in these five hindrances. We are going to lost in the uh, unrealistic expectations of our client. They want to have more control. They want to be, feel good about themselves. They want for more justice. And, and because of all these wants and expected uh, unrealistic expectations, they will be giving away the opportunity to exercise leadership. Uh, and if you put all these expectations in an organization, and this model comes from another elder or teacher of mine, um, he's a genius, his, his name is Barry Yoshi. Some of you might have heard of him, even studied with him. You know, if you put all these things together in an organization, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff happens, you know, all kinds of problems come together and the system creates the problems. Top 
they they one thing to be in control, end up controlling the whole situation. You know, they assume all control. Bottoms, they want to be innocent. They assume no responsibility. And middle get getting thrown between and customers are complaining, you know, all that stuff. So the question becomes, so how do we get out of this? How do we get out of all these situations? I just, you know, I won't be, do, I want a good service to this model, so I'm just going to pass it off uh, right now. How can I move actually forward? And the question actually, the, the, the solution comes from, again, neuroscience, I think. And uh, I just like the way it comes away. And uh, neuroscientists, and especially someone called Jeffrey Schwartz, he has been working with uh, obsessive compulsive behavior disorders for many years. He has some books which are interesting to read. And he's come with, he's looked at how he has worked with obsessive compulsive behavior disorder. And he has designed, looking at how the brain works and how learning happens in the brain, he has designed this model he calls the ARIA model, you know, A-R-I-A model. And he says if, you know, he, he actually used this model to help his clients to actually change their behaviors, new behaviors, and actually get rid of their symptoms without, no, um, without any medication in like two, two weeks' time. And he actually, when he looked at how he actually did it, he said, you know, all actually behaviors, all habitual patterns, as we call it in the Gestalt approach, all habitual patterns, all habits are actually kinds of uh, compulsive behavior because we do it without thinking, without awareness. So he said, maybe this is, this is, this is the model for real learning or adult learning. So he said, for anyone to learn anything new, you know, there has to be actually four issues, four, uh, four steps or four ingredients, I would say. The first, first is you have to keep and put your attention uh, on the subject. So attention is the first one. You only learn the things that you pay attention to. Let's say any of, anyone in this call does not have any, you know, um, uh, competence in drawing or, or painting, you know. So if we really put our attention on this, it's made it as important as any life goes and we, you know, practice for like three to six months, everybody will be a better painter than we are right now. So that's kind of the, the uh, thing. And the, he says, you also have to think about, you have to make your brain work in this subject and you have to get some kind of insight of, of the inner workings of the situation and you have to put it into action. So he, he just described this as the learning process that anyone has to go through. And he says this, and I'm, you know, I was working and this really looks like a coaching model. This is what we do with our clients. We actually trade, invite their attention to the, to the stuff that seems to be important. We ask them to reflect on the subject. We ask them questions, we give them feedback, whatever. We create some insights, then we create some kind of action plans with, the, uh, with their insights. But looking at this model, I kind of got the sense that this is also uh, the model for adaptive change and adaptive leadership. You know, how does a leader actually create some kind of adaptive change where the authority and technical expertise will not be enough? What do, what do they do? What they need to do? You know, and the question is, if they were able to get people's attention on the things that are necessary, you know, that on the issues that are important and necessary. And if they were able to get their attention on these subjects and kept their attention on these subjects, how much of the work of leadership will be done? You know, because the currency of the leadership is definitely, basically, if you think about it, you know, is attention. All leaders and uh, who are successful are at very successful of getting people's attention on where they want their attention to be. And all of course, so dem demagogues are as well, you know, in, in, in that sense. So where to put that attention? You know, the work of the leader is usually to, they have to get the people's attention in the need, needed change. They need to pay, pay, get attention on the problems 
and also the also the direction which you know a piece of authority would, would help so uh, the work is of the leadership is how can we get that attention on the issues that are important you know basically and also reflection uh, rub, reflection in the organizational change or leadership context becomes you know orchestrating conflict you know because uh, this will be a collective reflection and people come together you know how as a leader can i get people's attention in the areas that are most needed and how can i actually get people to engage in a productive conflict so new agreements and new understandings come out and how can we actually create new organizational experiments out of this you know which actually it creates some kind of movement some kind of change in the organization so people can actually make progress and get mobilized on the issues that are issues that are important so that's kind of the work of leadership and that's kind of work that i actually engage with my sorry about that i'm just learning my new computer uh, my get my clients attention on and so the question becomes so given this challenge of leaders what is our job as leadership coaches so several things you know looking at this model and the way i work with my clients several things that comes to my mind you know my first job is to help them to ask to help them to actually learn to ask repeated the most important change question what is really happening here not what's really happening inside, what's really, what's really happening here, and make effective assessment and diagnosis of the system they are leading. As Haifet says, most of the leadership errors are actually errors of diagnosis. And, and, the, and you know, just providing them with some effective maps and actually helping them create their own maps, which, you know, I'm just sharing a model of which, and which also involves helping them to develop ability to see many sides of a dilemma that they are finding themselves in, which seems to be very important in the, in the client work that I do. So to another thing that I think is, is uh, very important uh, when I'm working with my clients, is what I do with them is I'm actually supporting man, them to build capacity to stay present, mindful, awake, and alive in systemic complexity and cause, and, and navigate that complexity effectively. You know, that's kind of what I do. It seems to be what I do. And uh, also what I'm doing is to helping them become aware and manage their tendencies to fall in these, in these traps of leadership. You know, am I really doing leadership or, my, or, have, I all, or have I already sold myself short? You know, have I really practicing leadership or am I, have I resorted to the, uh, to, to, very well known area of using authority again because I'm not I don't know how to to manage the uncontrollable environment and the the VUCA environment that I find myself I'm finding myself in and the, the the other one is how can I how am how am I supporting my clients upgrading their lens to see and overcome the common error error of system and context blindness that we were talking about and also to help them in this way achieve a certain balance of humbleness and boldness when they are actually dealing with systemic complexity and predictable human uh, responses in, 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 in their work. So, and using this balance and a certain sense of awake mindfulness, because that's what's going to take and support them, use themselves as change agents to design and shape and lead adaptive change in a strategic way as we were talking. So I'm, I'm just, you know, putting this. So it's basically be present, be mindful, stay awake, pay attention, move forward. So this is why I call it outside in. You know, when I'm working with my client, it doesn't mean to, it doesn't mean a lot to start working from. So what are some of your, you know, maybe starting with a leadership, you know, assessment, and I love assessments. I really love Dorothy's new assessments. But it doesn't really help too much to start with an assessment in my work. You know, it is important. The assessments are important. But if you, if when I'm working with a client, if I start with the question, so what are some competencies according, where are you at your competence according to a given format, given model, and let's start working with you to, uh, to develop 
these competencies, it's useful, but I don't call it leadership coaching. It's something else. It's good coaching probably. If I could be helpful. But if I start asking, so what, what is the situation that you find yourself? What are you, what, are, what is your leadership agenda? What are you trying to change? And what is the, the important problem or the, or what is the, what is the important problem you are in charge of? You are in charge of. And what's really going on in your organization? You know, what, why are you having this problem? What is the kind of type of change needed? How much is technical? How much is adaptive? And how are people are engaging with this problem? Are people trying to control? Who are in the, who are triggered? Who's, who's in amygdala hijack? And what is the VUCA environment? What's really going on in here? You know, what is the history of this organization? History of this problem? What's your history, you know? And, and how are you avoiding, how are you avoiding this problem? So if we actually are, oops, wrong bottle. If we, after asking this question, if, can I ask, then I can look at the inside outward. So how are you part of this? You know, what competencies do you need to develop so you can deal with this kind of challenge? You know, so that's kind of inside out, outside in works in this type of situations. So which brings me to what is my job as the coach? You know, is it different? Is my job different than the, the client's job? And I find myself, it's very, very much, similar you know our we need to develop as coaches our ability to see many sides of a dilemma we have to develop our capacity to stay present with systemic complexity and chaos exactly as our clients has to and we have to build our strength of mind and heart to be with seemingly unresolvable challenges of the client to such a degree that we will not prematurely try to take sides bring structure or provide solution oriented techniques as i have told you in the beginning you know one to ten. Where are? Why do you want to be nine? Where are you? Three. How get? How do you get to three to nine? Does not work. If my client is working and trying to solve systemic complexity, and he's trying to move such a complex system from where it is to where it has, where it can be, you know. And this kind of act, as coaches, if we take this kind of act, which is you know just bringing premature structures, taking size, trying providing solutions is actually, I would say, an act of abandoning our client. And it's an act of actually abandoning ourselves, you know, because we're not paying attention to what we're in. We're not paying attention to what we are going on, what's going on inside. And so we're not going paying attention to our client. We're just trying to solve the dilemma. And we are trying to bring control to a situation when power is needed, as I was talking. You know, we're in the same hindrances as our clients, and we are trying to look good. We want to feel good about ourselves as problem solvers, as change agents, and we're actually giving away our power and responsibility as coaches. Interestingly, when this is happening, our clients are actually doing the same thing. When they are leading their organizations and adaptive change is needed, and they have to engage their people in this process of what do we need to pay attention to right now, let's decide which will be very un uncomfortable for many of the people because they will have to look into problems they haven't looked into for a long time for good reason because looking into these problems are actually challenging who they are, challenging their, um, their sense of self and identity and roles and all that stuff, you know. And it's just going to be VUCA, a little bit volatility, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of complexity and ambiguity. And, uh, and they won't be light because they will be disturbing people. Hopefully they can tolerate so they won't be assassinated. So that's if when faced with this very tough and necessary work, if they provide more authority than needed, which means more direction than needed, and there's some sort, sort of direction is needed, not too much. If they provide more protection than needed, you know, some kind of protection, which means uh, pacing the work, as we call in uh, our approach, in the Gestalt approach, you know, um, uh, the kind of creating safe emergencies, you know, that's kind of the or protection that's needed, that kind of the order needed, but if they provide more orders, more protection than needed, which means more structure than necessary or 
useful, what's going to happen is they, will, they actually are abandoning their organization, they're abandoning their uh, people, they're actually abandoning their leadership agenda. And in a way, they're also abandoning themselves. So this is kind of the work. How can I support by being present, by staying present, and by being aware? My, how can I support my client to actually face the dilemmas they, are, they have to be faced? And I see that you are raising your hand at the perfect moment because that was actually the end of my sentence. Yes. It's, 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 it, your work now is just so relevant for where we are in a world that is very shaking. I mean, there's chaos in every part of the world and organizations are confronted yeah. with so many challenges. And I wonder if this is a good moment to hear the impact you're making on those uh, who want to hear their voice before we say goodbye because your material is... It's actually too much yes. for an hour, but oh, no. But actually perfect yes. for our ongoing conversations. And to really support you, I want to invite you to hear the impact you're making from our dear friends. Yes, Dorothy. And I thought I had a one and a half hour, and I was actually just going to stop now and ask the same question. Wonderful. I didn't know I had a one hour. Sorry about it for the no, time no, over. No, okay. actually, no, no, no. You, 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 you have time. But still, I want to... Okay, say good. Yes, good. So, please... I will, I will, you know, anyone who wants to share. So how is this impacting you or, you know, what's catching your attention? Please, please do so. Well, actually, maybe those, uh, I'd like to invite uh, anyone who, who is perhaps with a question. This is maybe unmute yourself yes. if anyone's muted or raise your hand so we could know if you're there. Um, yeah. So well, maybe, so, well, that's still, that's still my hand, lower hand. Well, maybe Jost, I want to ask you just as a, as a... Story, I think there was a, there was a question from someone, but I don't see the face of that person. I saw a hand. Jost, it's Marianne, and I don't want you to see me. Hi, Marianne, how are you? Hi. Nice to see you and hear you again for many, I, after many years. I, I didn't realize this, and, uh, I look like hell. <laughs> so, Marianne, I cannot understand. I think there's a lot of echo when you speak. Those, Marianne is, is feeling perhaps she doesn't look at her best. And Marianne, I, I would really invite your voice because you look fine. I invite, <laughs> I, I invite your voice. I do see your, your ceiling, but I invite your voice. Uh, well, I've got yes. both my iPhone and my laptop because I can't get the volume on my laptop. So, I don't know if this Actually, may, may I recommend something, Marianne? If you allow, uh, can you mute yourself? Actually, Marianne, can, can, can you hear me, Marianne? Because what I'd like to recommend is you type out the question so I can say it, because something with your voice um, control on your computer is creating an echo. Sadly okay. enough, I'm very familiar with these technological challenges. All right, okay. Yeah. That was better, wasn't it? Yeah, much better. Oh, shoot, I came out of here. Well, Marianne, you actually sounded very good there. So anything you want to say right now? Perhaps okay. A moment. Hang on, Dorothy. I can't, so yeah. my, my tech, that technical stuff isn't working real well. Just, just speak it. Forget about writing it. Just speak it. You sound good now. Somehow I muted the right person. It wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm listening to this, unfortunately, because I didn't have volume at the beginning. I didn't hear everything. Um, you know, I'm looking at this boast as role of coach and then role of the person in the leadership position. Yes. And... Yes. Um, you know, being brought in, I was brought in to work in a couple small family businesses as, you know, the second in command or whatever. And, you know, trying to determine how quickly change is to be made. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I lost a lot of people was I wanted the change, you know, I wanted it now. I wanted to do it right now. Yes. And also working, if I'm working with a client, 
you know, you know, cha I know change comes very, um, it's hard. It's it hard. Is. How do you, how do you, it is. huh? How it you is hard, I said, yes. How do you gauge that when you're coaching? You know, how quick the change or mm -hmm. then how much do you, um, what do you do when there is absolutely no change besides get frustrated? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent question. Um, so, Marianne, this is exactly what, you know, my, most of my clients and some of the, it, it is exactly goes to the heart of some of work, some work, most of the work that I do with my clients and, you know, everybody wants change. Uh -huh. Everybody wants to change now, you know, and everybody wants to change to be painless. Everybody wants to change to be controllable, you know, and everybody wants to, the, everybody, everybody wants everybody else to be happy with the change that's been going to be made, right? Would you right. agree? And I called all of those unrealistic expectations, uh -huh. you know? And the change, and my job, if I was working with you or any leader, or the, the best service that I can do is to help this person first to make a better assessment of what's really going on, you know, the kind of type, type of the change needed, the situation the organization is in, the abilities of the situation, so they can actually understand what's going on. Let me give you this example. I, I already started this example of this, this company that was run by this very uh, egocentric, not egotistical, but egocentric person. And then there was this leadership change. You know, this person was an old, kind of old school male guy. And he was running the company for, I don't know, as I said, 20 years. And he was like the dictator of the company. He was doing everything. He, nobody was being done without his knowing you know that was the situation and and as i said he was thrown out and my client who comes who actually she used had she used to work with a northern european like a swedish company you know he comes from she comes from this organization which is very postmodern you know very you know uh, participative leadership kind of you know we first discuss you know we we have to reach in some kind of a consensus everybody is heard and then the change is made and you know, he's, she's been brought from this company because they knew that was his, her culture and they asked her to bring that culture, you know. But how do you bring that kind of change, like a postmodern participative leadership kind of change to a company that has been run for 20 years under a very egocentric, you know, you know leaders kind of uh, way. So first, you know, you have to move forward because there are no rules first you have to create an create uh, rules you know you cannot go to directly to you know postmodern participative leadership first there has to be some rules that is applied to everyone maybe some kind of authority after there's some rules like sops you know uh, the my client actually the, the sales people there is no control of sales people he put some kind of tracking devices in the cars of the salespeople and there was like a riot, but that had to be done. You know, first there has to be rules, you, you know, from egocentric, you go to the traditional, which is conventional, you know, the rules. Only after you have conventional and traditional systems in place, now you go to, you know, management by numbers. Let's have goals. Let's, let's have some, uh, have a system of performance management, you know, after you have performance management, now we can talk about, let's go into the participate of leadership. And she was given the work, change this company in six months. It took three and a half years, you know, to reach that situation. So that's why, I mean, if you go inside out with your client, hey, I want to do this. Okay, let's talk about your competencies to impact people and influence people and how do you get your, them on board? How are you going to influence them? How are you going to make them come with you? you no, know, you're coaching at the wrong stuff. You first have to coach, 
What is the situation? Do you have the correct reading of the situation? Do you understand the situation that you are in? Do you have the right models, right understanding, right conceptual um, and contextual understanding of the situation? So when I come back to you, you know, when you're make, talking about the change not happening, what's really happening there? You know, why is not, what is the type of change? What are you trying to change? How, what part of the change is technical that you can change with authority and expertise? And what part is tough change you are trying to make is really, is going to disturb people, is really going to make them face hard realities about themselves and their organization. And they are, going, they, they are going to really push them out of their situation and they will be living in VUCA for an extended period of time. So if you, don't, if you have an understanding of it, then the work of leadership becomes, how can I go at a pace that is you know, pushing them a little bit but not too much. So they either fall out or they start making me the problem. You know, as I heard from Dorothy and I love and use this phrase a lot, you know, one step ahead, you're a leader, 10 steps ahead, you become a target. You know, you become the problem as you are trying to lead the change. So that will be kind of my take on what you're saying and kind of, you know, do, do we make a better assessment? This is actually exactly the summary of what I was trying to say. So Dorit, I also see you raise your hand again. Well, first of all, I also, uh, Marianne, thank you so much. It's a, it's a question on, about change that keeps reoccurring. I know that though some people thought we only had an hour and, a, an hour and 15 minutes, so I'd like to read you. Yes. I know Paula's on the line. I think she's calling in from something uh, that, that there is no audio. So Paula says, thanks, Dose. This has been so refreshing because it points us in the direction of getting into the client's world and supporting the client exactly. from that place. It's not that the message is so new, but what's so elo it's what you did was present it so eloquently yet practically. And I, I really thank you, Paula. And the, I think, thank Paula, thank you. Um, and also from John, and I'm not sure that he wants to, it, me to read this. John, you want to give, give me a hands up? I should? Oh, actually, I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself to say this to our dear friend, Dose. Unmute yourself. Are you there, John? No. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Dose. Yeah. Good to see you. Abby. Hi, John. Nice to hear. Nice. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You. There's so much here, and yes. uh, And I find myself needing time to reflect on yes. content and how that how that has an impact on me and my work with leaders, how I personalize that in terms of my own clients and how I work with them uh, and, and their particular issues. So um, I, I find myself wanting to remember all of this. <laughs> so yeah. if I, I, I would love to get a copy of the text so that way I actually can take the time to reflect on this. So, uh, John, John, you are bringing me exactly to my last point. I actually do, this is like the summary of an art article that I wrote, like a white paper. Mm -hmm. And I will be sending this out to uh, Marta to send everyone who is on this call, you know, just right after this. So, you know, you will have the text and I would love to have that conversation with you whenever you want and anyone in the call as well, you know, so I will send you an article. Thank you very much, Dust. That would be very helpful. Yes. Um, I know. Great. So I, I, I cut you, please go forward. The one, the one thing that I learned from you and from Dorothy was to take the time to reflect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, good. Wonderful. <laughs> So uh, wonderful. I, I think actually, John, you know, you, you, you make all of us smile because you are our colleague and remind us the things that really had impact are the things that we should treasure as well. Dos, this is huge uh, session for us. And I think this is the core of your work and we've caught you as you're walking on this path. Now that you've spent a little bit of time with us, anything you want to say to us as you're closing? Sorry. Yes, the, the last message I think I have is, is, you know, I'm also a martial artist. And this is actually from, you know, for all us leaders and the uh, coaches, you know, in Bushido, this samurai warrior code, they say in combat, you can 
you know, and I cannot read this because of the chat thing. So okay, you, you can rely only two things. It's your training and discipline, you know, we have to be prepared in a mind that is free from expectations and results. So, you know, this is what I want to leave you with. Thank you very much for this call. Um, and I'm, I'm always happy to share this model and I always know it never fits the time that's given to it. So thank you very much Dorothy, for making this possible. You know, I really love this series and I really love the awareness IQ team. Thank you very much. And I, I, I want to thank you both, actually. It's the, I'm here at the ACTO conference, and we have like 150 people from all over the world. But I think as I listen to you and I listen to our friends here, it's these moments of coming together where we can share what we know that the next conversation mm. is uh, obviously possible. Mm. I invite you, uh, everyone on this call, to our next conversation. I know, Dost, you're going to be sending us the link. Martha, I know, is going to be sending yes to all of our dear friends and those that couldn't join us. Uh, I want to thank you, Andrea, for our backup support. And Dost, I want to say to you what I always say, it's an honor and a joy to walk on this path with you. So I thank you. It's always great. Thank you. I'm inspired by you. And today was really a beautiful session with these uh, core points to also be inspired in these moments of challenge. So Chok, to Shekular, many, many thanks to everybody. Be well. Uh, all the people, John, uh, Anne, Paula, Mary Ann Kerr, uh, I think I, I'm not sure some of the iPhones don't show your name, uh, Paula Wind, and Begler. I just want to say thank you and our dear friend Dos for making our time across the world. It's like uh, 8.30 there now, uh, excuse me, 9.30 now. So have a great yes. evening, Dos, and uh, thank you. You too, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.